Are you ready to bring your real estate game to the next level? My name is James Prendamano. I'm the CEO and founder of Pre-Real. And over the past 25 years, I've closed over a billion dollars in transactional real estate. Each week, I'm meeting with outstanding investors, high-performing individuals, and visionaries operating in the real estate space. These are the people that are actually out there in the real estate game right now getting it done. This podcast aims at bringing anyone's game to the next level. This is the Pre-Real Podcast. Welcome, everyone, to the Pre-Real Podcast. We are joined today by Quentin D'Souza. Quentin is the founder of Apple Ridge Homes and author of several books, one of which we're going to talk about today in detail, the, the Action Takers Real Estate Investing Planner. But he also happens to have a portfolio that's pushing up close to $100 million in assets. So we are super, super excited to have Quentin on the show today. Quentin, thank you so much for taking the time out. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it, James. So uh, where to begin? Uh, you, you've, <laughs> you've, you've kind of run the gamut uh, with asset classes and, and you've built really a remarkable portfolio. We, we were talking offline uh, before we started the show and uh, the Action Takers Real Estate Investing Planner uh, is a book that is centered around goals, if you will, and, and Quentin can get into this. And I was just watching earlier today uh, one of the uh, YouTube uh, posts that you had up talking about goals. And of course, being that we're getting into the end of the year, this is the most appropriate time to, to have this discussion. Um, but before we, we get into the, the specifics, can you give the audience, you know, if you had to give a, a two or three minute elevator pitch, could you just give them your background? Because it's pretty remarkable. Oh, thanks. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I was, um, I was a teacher. I started investing in real estate in 2004. Uh, and I it was really a pre-construction property. And then in 2008, I started to buy uh, three or four properties a year. We're using uh, the Burr method, which we called the buy, fix, refinance and rent because there was no acronym at the time that was, uh, you know, people have been doing it for decades. So, uh, you know, it's it's just a strategy that, that I, I used to build my portfolio. It started with one to four unit properties. By, I, by the time I got to 2013, I could leave my job as a teacher. I have a master's in education and uh, the school board was uh, pushing me to become a school principal. Um, I decided not to do that and continued to focus on my real estate portfolio, which had been growing in the background. And then in 2014, I started to um, invest full time. I flipped about a dozen houses. 2015, I, I realized that flipping houses was actually more of a job than I had before. So I, I stopped doing that and I focused on uh, repositioning apartment buildings in 2015. And that's where I've been able to grow and scale, bring on partners. And that's really where the uh, real estate portfolio uh, jumped in value and also uh, jumped in rents. Uh, you know, we're, we've, you know, we've really got that humming along and I have a business now rather than, you know, being self-employed, which is what I, I felt like I was before. Uh, so that brings me to, to this point. I, I've written several books, uh, all available on Amazon and, uh, and I kind of share the different strategies that I've used and different things that I've learned over the time, over time. So at the very beginning, I focused on property management and I wrote a book on property management. Then I, I, I wanted to improve the, my filling vacancies process. So I wrote a book on filling vacancies. I, I co-wrote a book with my friends on the buy, fix, refinance, and rent strategy, which people on Amazon tend to point out is called the Burr strategy. But uh, <laughs> we, we, we wrote that book before then, <laughs> right? And, um, you know, and, and I just continue to, to share my knowledge because I'm a, still a teacher. That's, that's what I do. But um, I am more focused on my real estate portfolio than ever before. I realized that instead of teaching about People, like teaching people to buy real estate made more sense to invest in the real estate yourself. And, and that's what really where I focused and, you know, growing my portfolio. 
Um, I should be, if we close all the transactions that I have in the pipeline today, by March, we should exceed over a hundred million in assets. So um, it'll be, it's really good. And I do um, partnerships. Uh, I don't do syndications in the same way as it, it's outlined in it, like how, how you see in the U.S. I, the smallest ownership stake I have in any asset is 25%. Um, so it's, uh, and then the, of course the most is a hundred percent, right? So sometimes I'll own a building by myself. And, uh, so it just depends on, on what I'm doing. That's the, the crux of it, uh, you know, my high level where I'm at. And I, I'm, I also invest in the U S I've got, uh, some, some properties in the U S I've got four in uh, Tampa. I've invested in a bunch of syndications down there for a different reason, more for, uh, currency hedging and also um, hedging against the Canadian economy. Uh, and when we go on vacation, we always spend US dollars. So it works out pretty well. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, thank you for the, the intro. It, it's tough to, to roll all of that up in, in a few eloquent sentences. And you, you, you know what, for many of us, we, we, we think about doing this and we think about launching our career uh, mm -hmm. and stepping away from what it is that, you know, we did for our nine to five to get into the business. There's a, like you had said, the Burr method became sexy recently. You know, those of us who have been doing it for 20 or 30 years, we never called it the Burr method. Uh, that didn't exist. Um, and it, it's, it's difficult though for folks to, uh, to, to make a clear, intentional decision to take that step. So I'm curious for you, you're, you're a teacher not too long ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what was it? What was the trigger for you where was someone in real estate or what was it that said, you know what, I, I want to do something different here? You know, I've been I've been always doing things on the side forever. Like even when I was a kid, I was like mowing lawns and I had three paper roots and, you know, I I would... I would get my sister to help me put, put the papers together. And, and then, you know, I would deliver them. I was always doing different things, but I found that, you know, um, when the way that I saw teaching and the way I saw a school principal, I felt like it was somebody who was the, the role had changed and be, become something that's more like a middle manager that kind of just does what the school board is kind of pushing down. And I, that's not something, that's not the reason why I wanted to be in that type of position. I am somebody who likes to be in, in control of what's going on and how, how things are going. And, you know, I, I wanted to, to do that. And I saw a business as a way for me to be able to do that myself. I wanted control of my time. I didn't want to have somebody tell me, you know, where to be and when to be there. I wanted to be control uh, on my location. So I wanted to be able to say, I'm going to work from here, or I'm going to work from Ottawa, or I'm going to work from California, wherever I am. I wanted to have financial freedom, so I didn't have to worry about working. And, um, you know, if I didn't want to work and go golfing, I could do that. And I also wanted to have thought freedom. And that's something that people perhaps don't think about. But when you have a job, somebody else is telling you how to think. And I am not one of those kind of guys. So I, um, you know, those, so all of those reasons helped me to make that decision. And then in 2014, you know, I, um, once I was able to achieve financial freedom through my real estate portfolio, then I, I, I could find like my true north and, and kind of keep growing. Right. And I, I got this little ring. I don't know if you can see it. I got this little pinky ring and I got the 2014 on it with a little star. And, you know, it's just a reminder to me. That's when I, I started to find my true north. Right. Try to figure out the real direction of my life and, and where it was going to go. And before that, it was you know, something else. So it's pretty, So, you know, the, the finding your true North, uh, was this, you're, you're talking about a, a lot of, of things that seem uh, obvious on the surface, but they're not right. Control of your time, control of location, financial freedom, thought freedom. Uh, was it a purposeful methodical, 
uh, you know, process of stating goals, clearly identifying uh, how, how did these are real intentional, specific things you're talking about, right? So in yep. the abstract, these are things that, that we think of all the time, but how, how did you get to such an intentional, specific set of things to pursue? That's, that's a good question. And it's part of my planning process, how, how I do my goal setting. So I do 10 year goals. So I don't just do like goals for the next 90 days or the, like the next three years, I, I do goals for 10 years. So back in 2010, I was setting goals for 2020. And, um, and I set goals, not just on financial, but like relationship, physical, like uh, health goals, all of those type of areas, right? So I, I'm, I'm setting all those goals and um, what I intend it to look like 10 years from now. I've got like a, a vision board that I have. It's actually a screensaver on my computer that, not a screensaver, but you know, that background on your computer. So I've been looking at that for, for a decade. I've got a um, 10 year letter to myself that's on my bulletin board. That I that I read and, and I refer back to myself and and that gets renewed every couple of years actually I go back and I set new goals that um, because what I found is that I've been able to achieve the goals that I had 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 put down as ten year goals a lot sooner than it took me to do so I'll give you an example like I mean you don't know my history but I. I used to weigh 330 pounds, like I, but, and when I, 10 years ago, I had set those goals to, to run a marathon and at my weight and, and that, you know, at that time, it's just not conceivable. Right. But what I did was I, I looked at those goals and as I continued to develop my, my 90 day, like my, my 90 day plan, right. Cause I don't, I don't do annual planning. I, I plan out 90 days. I've been doing that for, for a, over a decade. And, um, I was able to achieve the goal. So I started off, you know, losing weight. Then I started to do a 5k run. Then I did a 10k run. And then I did a half marathon and then I did a full marathon. And so I was able to achieve those goals in four or five years versus the 10 years that I thought it would take me to do. Right. Um, or, or the goals that I had set myself for 10 years. And the same thing happens with all my goals that I set. And that, that's why it seems like I'm really intentional because I am like, I, I do have that, like a 10 year, uh, 10 year um, horizon that I'm looking out. And then I'm working backwards to be able to, to achieve those goals. And I don't do annual planning. I've never done annual planning. I always do 90 day, uh, 90 day goals. Uh, the reason why is that what, what happens, what I found when I used to do annual planning is that I would look at it in January and then I might look at it again in October. And I wonder how come I never achieved my goals. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. But when I when I have 90 day goals, I'm always looking at it every every quarter uh, and then I'm, I'm bringing it down. And as I'm writing my plan for the week out, because I do a weekly plan, uh, like on Sunday night, I'll look at my my quarterly plan and I'll work on certain goals that are helping me to achieve my quarterly goals. So everything becomes interconnected. And that's part of how I do my goal setting and goal planning. Um, you know, and, and at different times, like sometimes I would say that this whole idea of being balanced, I think is, is kind of a sham. Like I, I don't, it's hard to be balanced. You, you, you can't be balanced. Sometimes you. like, sometimes you've got to be like, you're focused on your finances and you really got to work on that. Sometimes it's like health. Like you really got to focus on your health because something's happened. Right. But like this idea of like, you know, being a balanced and perfectly balanced person, it's just, I don't think it's possible. But I think, um, you know, we shift from time to time. And if there is something that is totally out of alignment, it's up to us to try to bring that up a little bit, right? And to bring that back into to alignment as best we can. And usually that's something that you can see that comes out in your life when you're doing like your quarterly plans, like, could be relationship issues, it could be health issues, could be financial issues, whatever it is, right? So that's all part of that that planning process for me, anyways. Um, that's kind of a long-winded approach to <laughs> to you know, like that, you know, being specific about 10-year goals, but that's that's how I how I do everything, right? So 
there's, we, we all get to this time of year, Quentin, and yep. we all, we all sit down and, and we write down what we're going to, you know, accomplish next year. We've got a team of about 30 folks here. Great, great people. I'm very blessed to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we're, we're starting to focus now a lot more on, on mindset and planning and financial literacy and goals, something that uh, for a traditional brokerage uh, really was completely absent. Like nobody, nobody sat down and taught me about this stuff when, when I started 25 years ago in the business. And, you know, we're, we're finding that um, more times than not, folks fall woefully short of the goals that they jot down for their new year's resolution and, you know, all that good stuff that, that happens. Right. So, uh, and, and then I'm, I'm sure that, that the, the, the action takers, real estate investing planner walks you through some of this stuff, but for you before, before you got to this point, was there a mentor? I mean, how did, how, why did it work for you? That's what I'm trying to, to get to. Why did it work for you with, which such rose resounding results? So I've, I've taken a lot of coaching myself. So I've, I've been part of the strategic coach, which is Dan Sullivan's program. I, I was, I am part of the entrepreneur organization. Like I, I've, I've gone through a lot of like Tony Robbins uh, materials and, and what I've built is something that I felt worked for me and worked for real estate investing. Right. And, and what I, what I've also found are that all of those kind of work in concert with each other and, um, you know, create something that uh, I find is effective. There are a lot of tools within that that I speak about in the book, but really there are things like having an accountability partner. So every week on Monday, I'll go over my, the three, three goals that I'm working on this week. So I've got three priorities this week that I'm working on. Um, I've, I, I've got, I'm working on three items towards my quarterly plan. I've got that an eat that frog activity that I'm gonna do at the on Monday morning. I've got um, three, I'm working on finding funding and financing properties every week because that's what I do as a real estate investor. There's items that I'm delegating this week or dumping or I gotta do. So I've got that on there. And then I'm celebrating my life by doing some sort of activity and I'm working on a center of influence from my quarterly plan. So every week I'm doing those things and I'm going on Monday, I am talking to my accountability partner that I've had for years and years. And I'm telling him, these are the things that I'm working on. These are the things that I did that I did from last week. And then I'm, if I have to repeat the same thing over again to my accountability partner, I get annoyed with myself. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't like saying that I didn't get things done because I know I know my, I annoy myself. And if you do that in two weeks or three weeks, like it's just it's just not good. Then you just get it done. Right. So that accountability piece helps me. Planning out the week on Monday helps me. Um, you know, making sure that I I celebrate the success that I have. So helps me um, it's because I want to, I'm very practical and, and specific about what I'm celebrating. Also, you know, depending on what you're working on, you have to be able to measure it. So like in, um, in a brokerage, you might be uh, talking about, uh, you know, sales or listings or something like that. It, it, like when I'm thinking about my, um, you know, the way that I'm measuring, it could be uh, gross rents. What are my gross rents for the month? Do I want to get my gross rents up for the year or for like, you know, the quarter? So I'm, I'm, I always focus on the quarter. And so I look at how much, how many gross, how, how much in gross rents, how many new assets am I going to acquire this quarter, right? And I want to make sure that I want to push that up. Um, so all of that kind of feeds into you know what I'm doing. When like, if I'm trying to to grow wealthy, what's the thing that I have to measure? I have to measure my net worth. Have you like if you haven't done a balance statement before, how do you know what your net worth is? Right. If you're trying to lose weight, you got to measure yourself, right? Like the, all of these things are about about measuring. So um, you know, that's one of the other things that I do is that I, I'm actually measuring. Like um, when I do my quarterly plan, I actually have a balance sheet, right? I'm also I'm also scripting out the different sources of income that I have and what they currently are now, right? Because I have a lot of sources of income. I just don't have one source of income. 
right? What happens to a lot of people is that they have one source of income and if they lose it, they're scrambling to find a replacement for that one source of income, right? Yeah. So for me, that's, that's what teaching used to be for me, but I crossed that out back in 2014 and I replaced it with other things. So I have, um, I have, well, book income is not a good example, but it's not, you're not going to get rich off books. But like, you know, my, my real estate portfolio, which is huge, right? Like we, we, we get probably close to $450,000 a month in rents, right? Like it's, 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 a, it's a big number and um, that's continuing to grow and grow. Uh, on top of that, you know, we have the assets that are growing as well from an um, appreciation perspective, because we buy an appreciating market that has cash flow, right? So that we get that one too. Um, I'm looking at not only that, but I've got a property management business that's a component of that, where I have a team that, that I've hired who work for me, right? It's not a large amount of income, but it is something, right? I, I have, um, you know, a real estate club that I run. And there's people that, that are members that are part of that. And, you know, they pay $80 a month to be part of that. So that's part of, that's another source of income. Now, um, you know, could I cross out uh, one of those sources of income and still be okay? Absolutely. If I find that the, like the club is taking up too, too much of my time, I can stop it. Right. Um, if I don't want to promote the books anymore, like I can not do that. Right. And those the income would still come in from the books, but it wouldn't be the, the same. Right. So uh, but I can stop all of those because I have other sources of income. And so if people do that, if they create they're purposeful in how they plan and they goal set and they create these different sources of income, then, you know, they can cross out if they lose their job. It's OK. Right. Because they have other sources of income to cover it. Um, and that's what I encourage people to do with real estate investing. It's a great way to be able to do that, to have something that continues to pay you every month. If you're buying the asset well in a good, a good appreciating market with, with cash flow, pays you every month to own it. It's hedged, right? You've got, um, right now, you've got uh, negative real rates, like where your inflation rate is higher than what you're borrowing for. Like it's like a, it's a no brainer. And you're borrowing at a, a higher, like, it, like what other type of asset does a bank give you five times the amount that you are putting down in order to, you know, right. to own an asset? It's, it's beautiful, right? So like it, it makes, it only makes sense to be able to have at least, at least one, you know, so that you can have that for, you know, a part of your retirement, if that's what your goal is, right? Um, and I would encourage everybody to have one outside of their princ principal residence, right? So have like a couple of these rental properties chugging along, or invest in somebody else's project in, in a multifamily project, whatever you feel comfortable with, like maybe, because, you know, being a landlord isn't for everybody. But there are so many different ways to invest in real estate now. And you don't have to go to the stock market to be able to do that. You don't have to invest in a REIT to do that today. There's like, you know, podcasts like your podcast and you know, like to connect to other people to be able to do that. So there's just so many opportunities. Sorry, I can keep going. You gotta... No, no, this is <laughs> uh, Quentin. This is uh, this is really valuable stuff, and and it's valuable to me. So I know it's it's valuable to the to the audience. You know, we we see now on social media almost like a caricature of of the real estate investor, right? And and it's a beautiful woman or a beautiful man, and they're relaxed and they're you know on a beach and enjoying life, and everybody is a millionaire and everybody is doing so well that's not the reality of it. it. And it requires a massive, massive amount of discipline to a, achieve the level of success that you have achieved. I've been in and around the business for 30 years. Uh, I've seen great markets. I've seen not so great markets, you know, 2008 was wow. no walk in the park, but, but it did um, yield a lot of opportunity. And, and the, the longer I'm in the business, the more uh, well-rounded we become, right? And in, in understanding what's coming down the pipe and, and what are the angles and where are the opportunities to seek. But to get there, it, I mean, it's a hell of a journey. It's not easy to, to you know, make these 
these massive leaps in in asset class jumps that you've made. I mean, to go from you know one to four families up to as we had said at the onset, pushing a hundred million dollars in portfolio. Uh, I've seen a lot of folks, including myself, get stuck along the way. You know, uh-huh. you, you start buying two family, three family, four family. Uh, you, I made a mistake uh, years ago of buying a building um, that was it was a great value. Um, it cash flowed, but it was not in my local market, and it was in a market that was not um, it was not dense enough where I was able to acquire any kind of critical mass. So I, I was in no man's land. I, I, it wasn't a big enough asset to have a full-time maintenance person, right? Because it would have sapped the, the cash flow, but there was not enough opportunity around there to pick up enough units to get to that level, right? So these yep. are mistakes that you fall into as you're going along. Uh, and I think it's fascinating that you've done it with such absolute precision. And, and um, you know, we have a book club here that we do every Tuesday morning. And I'm going to add the Action Takers Real Estate Investing Planner to the book club because I think it all starts and stops with goals and intentionality. I think you have to be extraordinarily uh, defined and intentional in what it is that you're you're trying to achieve. So as you're setting these goals up and, and you're you're taking a look at at 10 years down the road. Uh, you had said that you chop these up into 90 day sections. And then mm-hmm. uh, I guess it's a 90 day overview. And then do you have uh, weekly planners, daily planners? How are you yep. breaking that 90 day period up? And what does that look like? Yeah. So what I, once I've done my, my, so of course I, I spend a lot of time on my 10 year goal, right. And like planning like, like a day, it's not like, you know, I do it in an hour or something like that. Like this is where you spend a day kind of working on the quarterly plan takes, takes probably three or four hours to do it. Cause I'm connecting it up to the 10 year. Then every Sunday night, I work on my weekly plan. My weekly plan is on my, my desk right beside me. I still do it in paper because I'm still old school like that. Right. Like I've got a paper copy of my, my, my weekly plan and I'm, and I refer to it. And as I get things done during the week, I'm checking it off. Right. As, uh, as I'm going through it, like I'm, I, I'm actively um, insure. And the reason why I kind of like having a paper version, and maybe this is just me is because I can, I always see it. If I have it on my, in an app or I, if I have it on a computer program, it's closed. I don't see it. But every time I look to my right, I see what I need to work on and, and then I'm focused on it and I'm working on it. And um, so that's, that's, that's part of it, being able to see that, that plan and then, and then focusing on it. I can see what I have to check off and what I've already checked off this week. And then like when I go back to look at it at the beginning of the day, I see, oh man, I got to get that done. So then I'll work on it. Right. And so um, that's what I find has, has been helpful for me when it comes to the like so the tenure goals quarterly plan weekly plan and then um and then when i do my quarterly plan there are a few different tools that that are part of the quarterly plan that help me to prepare me in order to to um when i'm working on my weekly plans to give me a focus right um so if i if i wasn't if i didn't have financial freedom then i would be focusing in in my quarterly plan to add more income into what I'm doing, right? So it would be uh, like my focus would probably be to add another, let's say if you were to ask me 10 years ago, it might be like add another $1,000 in cash flow to my, um, to my monthly cash flow, right? For the quarter, that would be a quarterly goal, for example, that I would work on. And, and what would that look like, the actions? It, for me, it would probably have been acquire two to three more duplexes, right during that quarter um and and how I, how would i also do that i would probably take on partners to be able to do that because i found that if i took on a partner you know we may have been able to 
um, to cash flow $800 a month or $1,000 a month. But if I didn't have to bring the money, then I could still achieve $500, but uh, I could um, I could scale more. Like I could do a little bit more on the scaling side. So that that's what I would do. And, and that's all part of my quarterly. And then when I look at the, my weekly, I'd say, okay, I, am, I need to find two duplexes or two, um, two properties that I need to be able to duplex. So I would add value to it. So I would buy a single family home and add an accessory apartment to it. You might call it an accessory dwelling unit, something like that. Um, and that, so that would be part of it. The funding part would be uh, find a potential partner, uh, but I'm always looking for partners every week, right? So that, that's, that's part of the process. And then financing would be, okay, what banks can I work with or what credit unions or who could, private lender can I work with who's going to help me achieve that particular goal, right? Yeah, and so then, I'm sorry, to, just to, to be clear there, as you're saying, uh, you're, you're seeking partners out, you're so are, are you seeking partners that are staking equity and you're going out and securing traditional institutional debt to conclude the transaction? They're putting up capital and they're passive investors. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. So it depends when we're working, when I was doing one to four unit property. So this is, this is before, right? I would take on partners who would bring uh, bring the property and qualify for the mortgage. So that would be, so it would be more of a straight joint venture partnership that you might've heard of in the past. That's, that's how I would do it, but I would do all the work and we would split it 50, 50 because I had the model. I know the, I have the team, I have the, the trades, I have all the relationships to ensure that everything gets done. And what we would do then is once all the work was done, we would refinance the property. They would get their funds out as much as we could on the refinance. Um, most of the time, it wasn't a home run. Occasionally, like one in 10, it would be a home run and they'd get all their money back. But usually they would get back on top of the renovation costs, let's say five or 10% when they were putting 20% down. So that's a, that's a huge number. And then they would roll that into the next property, right? Because they got the funds back. They're super happy. They're getting cash flow, right? And so it was easy to scale because I, I kept doing all the work. They kept bringing the money, helping to qualify, and then we could continue to scale. Um, as we get into the uh, larger apartment buildings, it, it, the the way that the partnerships work would be different, right? So uh, what I would do is I would have the same sort of system, except we would have a corporate structure. And um, when you have the corporate structure, the corporation would buy the apartment building, and then the partners would buy shares in the corporation. They would own uh, shares up to 50%, and then I would own 50%. Because I'm finding the property, I'm spending the time repositioning it. In the U.S., often you see that like it's like an 80-20 split or something like that, or a 70-30 split. In Canada, I've always done a 50-50. So like um, it's I, I've I have the track record, I have the experience, I've like I have the team. So that's the way I've I've always positioned it. You can partner with me or not. I don't care. Like, because uh, right. I've, I've been doing this long enough that I know what I'm bringing. So I've, I've been able to do that with, uh, with partners and I still own 50% and they own 50%. They bring all the funds um, because it's an apartment building. I'm doing the, like um, in the U S you have non-recourse mm -hmm. uh, loans for apartment. It doesn't happen in Canada. Everything is recourse in Canada, right? Except for Alberta, but everything is recourse in Canada and you have to personally guarantee everything. Right. So because when I look in the U.S. and the kind of stuff that I can do down there, I'm like, wow, this is like Candyland. Like yeah. this is a, I got I got like so many different lenders that work with, you know, and stuff like that. You don't know how much I appreciate when I look at stuff in the U.S., how many like opportunities you have down there. It's, it's really amazing. Anyway, so I've got to qualify. I've got to, I've got to be personal guaranteeing on these buildings and then my partners are bringing the funds and I'm going through the same process I used to do on one to four unit properties, but now it takes me two or three years to do on the apartment building. So, um, for example, I just bought a 12 unit building three years ago for 1.75 million. I just got it uh, refinanced or reappraised now for 2.65 million and we have a new mortgage for 1.9 million so my partner's getting back his 
500,000 and we're splitting the 75 K each. And he's rolling that into a 24 unit building that I'm, that I'm buying. Right. So it, it just keeps like sure. snowballing. Right. And then as you do this and you develop a good reputation, more and more people are going to want to do that with you. Right. As people get to know you and they like you and they see that you are trustworthy and continue to do what you say you're going to do. These people will tell these people and then, you know, and then you can continue to, to grow. Right. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. So the, you know, in, in the States, um, you, you hear a lot of the folks that are just getting into the business doing 70, 30s and 80, 20s, but uh, we do deals 50, 50 and we do the inverse. We've gone as high as 75, 25, wow. uh, because like you said, you know, we've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, we've made our clients, uh, you know, thankfully we've, we've done real well for, for our clients over decades now. So when you have that track record and you're bringing uh, the expertise, you're bringing the deals um, uh, the returns can be really attractive. Even when an investor is only taking 25% back on a deal, they can be really, really attractive. Yep. And, and having some of the tools that we have here, as you had mentioned, like non-recourse debt, um, it really gives you the opportunity to take some, take some shots and, and, you know, you could do some damage here. Um, I'm, I'm curious as you're, as you're underwriting deals now, uh, what does that look like for you? Uh, are you focused on cash on cash? Are you focused on the cash flow? Uh, what metrics stand out for you and, and you know, a, a typical building? What type of returns are you looking for at this stage in your career? Yeah, you, you know, that's a good question because a lot of the, like when you look at Toronto and you look at cap rates, they're like sub 2% cap rates. It's like Oof. craziness, right? So I, I'm looking at other markets within Southern Ontario where I can get like a four and a half cap rate. And even that is kind of tight, but I know that when I turn over those units that there's like a four or $500 difference in rents. So the, the future rent bump on the turnover is going going to allow me to get the value increase that will bump that up enough. I also want to see, so it, like, I'll tell you what, like I, cause I understand both markets in, in the U S you have, like when you deal with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and, and those type of lenders, your rates are still higher than my rates with uh, CMHC in Canada. So we can get like a sub 2% rate sometimes for, wow. uh, and like, and this is for apartment buildings with like a 35 year AM, 30 year AM, sometimes a 40 year AM wow. if, if it's a new build. Um, right. And you can get like a higher loan to value, like 80, 85 percent. Typically, like conventional is 75 percent. But when you go to like CMHC, which is equivalent to your agency debt, like you can get up higher. And so what ends up happening is that results in a better ROI for me on my investments. Like I, I would never leave investing in Ontario, except for the fact that um, I can get some currency hedging and I can, I can, I understand real estate so I can continue to invest in it in the U S but like my returns are quite, quite good. And um, so there, there's a lot of opportunity for me here. The challenge that I have is that the, the, the real estate market in Ontario is like California and New York, man. Like it's, <laughs> it can be it like the rent control, right? Our rent control is like ridiculous, right? You can't, do any rent increases and like next year's rent increase is 1.2%, right? So like it's, it's tough, but um, it is, if you're turning over a unit and it becomes vacant, you can bring it up to market rent, right? And so like those two books that I've written on property management, like I understand the market. I understand how to be able to do what I need to do in order to, to, to turn, turn over those units. So um, I'm looking at, you know, four and a half cap rate. I'm still looking at cash flow from the asset. I, I do not buy anything that's negative cash flow, even for the apartment buildings. And I want to see a spread between what I'm, my, my rate is for uh, borrowing 
and the cap rate, right? I want to see that 2% spread at least, because at least if with that, within that spread, I know that I'm going to be able to carry the asset and then I'll start working on and repositioning the asset. We'll lower the expenses. We'll put in LED lights. We'll, we'll do like the low flow toilets. We'll do like everything that we need to do to turn over uh, to reduce the expenses. And then we'll start working on increasing cash for keys, do whatever we have to do to you know, uh, put pressure on those, the low quality tenants in a building, like really, you know, work on that. And um, until we can get it to, to where we want it, and then we'll go and refinance the asset, right? And particularly on bigger buildings, I find that this works really, really well, right? And, and sometimes we get lucky, like we bought seven apartment buildings this year, and we bought it at like a five and a quarter cap rate. And um, the actual cap rate compressed by the time we went from conventional debt to agency debt right and so the like the cap rate became closer to four and a quarter so we're actually getting more from the the like from agency than we thought we were going to get so we actually did even better on the you know so we're actually returning funds to our our partners so like you, wow. you, you never know right like this is the beauty of real estate um, that's like a, a bonus, right? It doesn't always happen like that, but that was, that was really cool. But, you know, we work hard, like we, like we do, we work hard to make sure that we're able to, to do this. And, um, you know, I've got the bumps and bruises to prove it, right? Like it's, you know, there's, there's some, some, always some challenges, but I never say that I make mistakes. It's always about, <laughs> I've, I've had some good learning opportunities, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So you're, you're focusing on something that uh, not enough people talk about. We, we wrote up here uh, a program years ago that was focused on the commercial side, uh, but it was called the RPO, the, the Real Estate Portfolio Optimization Program. Uh, and this is something that folks do not put enough time and energy into after you've acquired the asset there uh, there is just gold nuggets typically in any transaction in any deal there are ways to optimize and skinny up on the expense side and to drive revenue on the income side and that's something that folks don't don't spend enough time in my opinion uh, looking at everyone's always racing to the next deal right it, it's the hustle and and we have found that just by taking a a much sharper look at the existing portfolio, there's an opportunity to really unlock some serious cash there. Absolutely. You know, that's, I think the difference is that they have not taken on the role of asset manager. They have left it to the property manager and said, you know, you property manager, you do what you do and everything's going to be all right because I picked the right property manager. That's not it. That's yeah. just the beginning, right? You have to manage the ass. I talked to a couple of guys. They were, they took me out to, uh, to lunch because they, they're starting to get into buildings. They bought like a 25 unit building and they were asking me how, like, you know, and they, they were telling people that they were getting returns of 10 or 12% or whatever it was. And then I looked at what they were doing and they, they're not even they're like other, they did reduce the expenses. So they were working on, you know, LED lights and, and that sort of thing, but they weren't trying to maximize the turnover of their units. So they just had, you know, they were, they, um, of the, the 25 units, they had three units turnover. And I was like, wow, that's great. Three units. That's, you know, between, that's like 12% or something like that. Right. And I said, well, so what did you do to get those over? Oh no, those were all natural. Oh, so you didn't even work on it. And you got those done. What if you, what if you actually, cause, cause each of those units turned over and it was a $500 rent increase on each one. And on a, like on a four cap property, that is, that's a, you know, hundreds Huge. of thousands of dollars. Huge. And so what if they, what if all they did was work on getting three more in that one year, they, they could have made a half a million dollars on that asset, uh, just a little bit more work, work on being an asset manager, right? Instead of like letting your property manager do what they do just by, by themselves. If you can take on that role as an asset manager, I, you know, that's definitely something that can, it could change the value of buildings. Like, dynamically. Huge. Yeah. Dynamically. Absolutely. So you're, you're looking at vacancy and turnover as opportunity and most real estate investors today, at least 
are looking at vacancy as um, as an uh oh, as as a as a we 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 would rather take a bird in the hand than than worry about what what we could potentially do in insofar as driving revenue. But to your point, um, there is real opportunity when you're. I call it being an operator. I have one of my business partners. Um, he is a, just a brilliant operator. He finds those opportunities and understands he's not afraid of vacancy. He's not afraid of, of pushing the envelope because he understands when you're an actual operator or manager and hands-on that there's just wins everywhere, man. There's wins everywhere. So uh, for us down here, I'm, I'm curious what the climate is up there. Regulatory risk is is a major major challenge for us here in new york now and mm -hmm. um there there is not the opportunity that there used to be uh although a lot of the legislation is well intended oftentimes in practice it just doesn't work so uh from a regulatory perspective you know are are is that something that's part of your analysis as you're as you're moving through the process and for us it's now top of the board on just about every project we look at or what are the regulatory risks is that something that really is has come into focus for you well regulatory risks are something that's always been a part of what we do right like it's you know with the the rent control rules that we've always had with the landlord tenant board regulations that we have um it's it's always been a huge risk and i mean it makes me actually want to to reach out and look into different places and that's also a good opportunity for me to continue to push into the us right yeah because i can go into the southern states and it's just totally different right and so yeah i i would say that 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 becomes part of it but i also know how to play within the rules and those the properties that we're purchasing in those those areas where regulatory um where regulations are higher, it also means that there are less competition. There's less people who are, are going to play in that space. The, pay, the, 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 the small landlords that play in that space, they usually get out of the market within a couple of years because they've, they realize that like, especially the, the landlords with, you know, they have one or two units and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden they have like a professional tenant that gets in there and then it takes them two years to get the tenant out. And like the asset isn't even worth as much as it costs them to be able to like all of those things play into. So if I understand that much better as a, as a, I wouldn't say that I'm a large scale landlord, but I, I would say that I'm bigger than average. Um, you know, I, I feel like I can withstand that a lot better. I, I'm happy if you don't pay in one of my buildings, because when I turn it, turn it over, the value of that building is going to go up, you know, a hundred thousand dollars versus it cost me maybe let's say 10 or $12,000 to get rid of you. Right. So yeah. the, there's that opportunity. Whereas in a comparative method, we're in those one to four unit space where the small landlords place there, it, it doesn't matter because they, they don't use net operating income to define what the value of their property is. It's about who sold their property next door. Right. right. And so they can't get that value increase where I can get it. So as a, you know, in those apartment building spaces, it's actually more worthwhile for me to be in the larger buildings because I have uh, an advantage over those one to four unit uh, space people. And like, oh my gosh, like the Facebook groups that are like in Ontario, like for landlords and for tenants, but just to try to help, you know, to like the government is, <laughs> they're, they're I guess they think that they're well-intentioned, but everything that they do seems to do the opposite of what their intentions are, right? They, you know, they put these additional regulations to, um, to protect tenants, let's say, but really all they're doing is they're creating less supply, uh, higher rents because of that. They try to put rent control on because why? Because there's no supply. Why? Because they have rent control, right? Like, you know, like right. it's, it's a self-replicating, uh, so, um, the, Yes, regulations are something that we look at, but for me, the way I play within that, like that's where I shine because I can, I can take something and make it into something different. And, you know, I've, I've created a lot of value over the last, you know, decade. Like I'm okay. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to be okay at this point. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to go under because of, you know, any, any big changes, but 
at the same time, I, I'm going to take my money where it is valued most. And if I have to, I would, right? I'm just not, you know, at this point, I know very well that I can play within the space. And, you know, I understand the regulations and I know it better than the average person. And that's why I can succeed in this particular area. It's a, it's a really good question, actually, because a lot of people, they get, as soon as they hear about, you know, New York or they hear about California, they go, oh, I'm out of here. It's crazy. But you know what? The, the thing is, if you can be successful here you, or in those markets, you can be successful anywhere. <laughs> that, that, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a piece of cake after that, right? <laughs> there, there, there's no doubt that that practicing for the last 25 years in, in New York has uh, given me a, a, a unique skill set that as I've uh, done more and more work in these emerging and secondary and even tertiary markets. Um, it's just a far easier uh, way of doing things, honestly. And and you you touched on a, a really important point before. You know, you said you're going to go where where they're valuing your dollar most. Uh, the the unfortunate reality here uh, is is a lot of investors are feeling uh, that it's just so much easier to do business in other places that uh, New York was the draw for New York. And, and the reason people tolerated the legislative uh, thresholds were because this was the epicenter for jobs. This is where if something went vacant, inevitably, you were going to find somebody else to backfill it, right? That's what it came down to. It was about dollars and cents. But as we're continuing to decentralize and people are, are, working more and more remote and now companies are subscribing to the the remote opportunity they're decentralizing it is really cast uh, a a bit of doubt over what does the new york market look like in 15 20 years you know we we were telling people 4 or 5 years ago uh, you know i shouldn't have bought that lot in downtown manhattan 20 years ago said nobody ever until now now people are starting to to look at the opportunity cost and the the threats and the legislative threats and inflation and all of the things that are happening and they're starting to hedge you know they're starting to go into different markets so that brings me to to my next question are are you exclusively in the the multifamily space do you have commercial holdings as well you know what i don't go into i i do have a little bit of uh, retail but i don't have any large commercial and i don't have industrial i did have storage uh before but we sold off the storage it was just too much unless unless you have a lot of scale it, it's it becomes a pain in the butt right and yeah. we, we did we had something like 60 units or something like that it's just too small to, to scale so we got rid of that um the um the retail that we have is just storefront and upstairs we had office and we're converting it to residential so it's a it's a play on that uh, particular market so that we can create more residential uh, um, in order to to up the value of the building and again be able to create you know um, do that value add so I, I kind of stay away from commercial I'm not I'm like I'm kind of scared of office like uh, you know it's something that really like I don't know what the future is and and you say when you're saying all that. I was probably in or I was in Orlando about uh, a month and a half ago, and there were so many people from New York there. Yeah. I was I was actually shocked. I was like, "You're from New York? You're from, you're from New York? What are yeah. you doing here?" It's like, "Yeah, well, my like my company said that I can work anywhere, so this is where I'm working." And it was like, "There was a lot of people there," so I was uh, I was surprised, and uh, California as well. Yeah, so, um, th- which kind of shocked me. So it was very interesting to, to hear. And, and I mean, that's anecdotal. I couldn't tell you what the real numbers are, but it, for me, I thought that was weird. Like I had, and I know that like, I, I hear that um, Americans move from state to state um, more easily than in perhaps other countries that you see people move from, from sure. you know, province from province, state to state. But it just seemed so weird that there were so many people from New York there, right? And there were, and some of the businesses had actually relocated to yeah. Florida. 
right? Because of, I think it was because of some tax reasons or something like that. Yeah, the, 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 the income tax, New York versus Florida. It, <laughs> the, 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 again, that, that ties back directly, Quentin, to regulatory threats, right? You know, so uh, I know that, that it's not your, your home market, so it's tough for you to put your finger on it, but let me give you a, a quick stat. So one of the very well-respected organizations here in, in New York, uh, released a report a few weeks ago, and the report indicated that 8%, 8% of office workers returned to work five days a week in New York City. 8%. Whoa. Whoa. That's, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That makes you, you that makes me want to think about office altogether as an asset class, particularly. But you know, the other thing too is that everything gets everything is cyclical and it may take two decades to recover. Yep. It may be the best time in the world because nobody likes it, right? It, it's hard, it's hard to say, but I would not want to be in that asset class today if I had uh, if I was looking at two or three or four or five years out, like just I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to look at that. Maybe like if I had a 20 year out type of perspective, but yep. you know, like right now that's scary. That's, that's, that makes me go. Luckily I'm, I'm focused in the Southern States right now for my U S stuff. I'm in uh, Tampa and uh, I've, I've got some stuff in Texas and, and Arizona. Like that's, that's my, where, where I'm focused right now. And, um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting that you're, you're bringing that stat up. So how do you feel like about the, where are you focused on in the, the markets in, in New York then? Are yeah. you in residential or? Yeah. So a unique time for us, you know, when, when we started to see the legislation ramp up uh, against the multifamily landlord owner, a few years ago, we recommended to clients uh, get out then, and many of them did. And we saw real opportunity in, in logistics, manufacturing, micro logistics. Uh, and we did very, very well for our clients. M property out here has easily doubled in the last couple of years. So um, we saw that coming. We shifted to uh, manufacturing. And now with inflation, you know, becoming a, a, a reality, uh, that again, gives us this uh, challenge, but opportunity to reevaluate, right? So, so where do you, where do you go next? And what do you do next? And uh, we think that in some of the, uh, the Southern states, uh, there is still real opportunity. Um, but, but again, you've got to be careful down there, because you do have a lot of folks that are buying payments. They're not buying sound real estate deals, right? Yeah, and, and they're creating these sub-markets uh, because you know what happens. One or two or three of them fall and that becomes kind of the, the bar and that's the comp. And then everybody trades off that comp. But uh, if you're not careful as the markets shift, uh, you, you hit a hiccup here. And if you're not optimizing that uh, those units, and you're not pulling out those RPO nuggets we talked about, you could end up in a real difficult spot where in a few years, um, some uncertainty in the market, inflation continues to rage along. Uh, you, I'm concerned about what's going to happen to some of that short-term debt. You know, folks that are in these, these three and five-year uh, deals, right? Interest only. And yeah, you know, yeah. Now, now all of a sudden rates have crept up significantly and the big institutional lenders are, are only looking at that A plus credit. We know what happens when the, the market yeah. turns, right? Yeah. Uh, and and I, I think there's going to be uh, 2024, 2025, I believe will be the, the greatest buying opportunity ever in the country. Uh, but I think it's also going to be very tough for, for some folks that that didn't have um, their debt stacked properly. You know, I, I do think one of uh, like, I do think in 2022, we're going to start to see more, more tighter lending requirements and lending standards. I think that that's, there's going to be more of a push for that. We're, you know, we're having a lot of 
reshoring that's happening so i can see how well that industrial is going to continue to do because of that reshoring but yeah. also i i think that you know the there is a real challenge for housing like just people living in places right and um whether you're buying a single family home or you're living in a multi-unit apartment building the challenge is that there's just not enough housing no matter where you are it seems that that seems to be the the case yep. now um it like when it comes to you know where to invest it. I always think that you're most of the time you're betting on the jockey and not necessarily the horse because you could have a like a secondary market, but you have an experienced operator who's been doing like work in that market for 20 years. It, it like the, everything else could be going to, you know, but that yeah. guy in that market or that lady in that market who really knows it is going to do extremely well, right? And so, like, you know, like. You know, when when I say New York, you know, and, and and you say, well, but we're looking at industrial in here, like that's you because you're experienced and you've you've shifted and you've changed. So, you know, people are betting on you, not necessarily like New York or you know that what's what's going on there. So I mean, and, and that's the same for other places around the country or in other countries, right? It's always about Who's who knows what it is that they're doing? They've been doing it for a while. They've got the you know they've they've gone full cycle in, uh, on projects. They can demonstrate the the results, and and that's where where you want to be when you're looking at those those different projects all over the place. You want to you know if you're going to go into another market and you're going to invest with somebody else, just make sure that they have the track record in that market to be able to demonstrate success, right? Absolutely, without question. Um, you know, I've I've kept you here for for already an hour, and I feel like I could I could go for for hours more. This has been a fascinating chat, Quentin. What where what's the best way for for folks to find your content and to to find you? I mean, the best way is to go to my uh, my podcast, getrealwealthy.com. I've got a YouTube channel there, or you can uh, catch me on Instagram or uh, Twitter at QMANREI, or you can go to my link tree, which is link. I don't know what it is. That's that URL <laughs> thing with whatever. I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll have it all uh, below, yeah. folks. So uh, uh, again, for the audience, definitely take the time to give Quentin's content uh, a, a good thorough look. It is outstanding. Uh, the, uh, again, the, the, the success here, uh, it can't be argued with. And, and he, he does take you down a real pragmatic path of how to get those goals set. Uh, the Action Takers Real Estate Investing Planner, we're adding it to book club next month. Uh, I suggest everybody give it, a, give it a shot. Quentin, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks so much, James, for having me. Really appreciate it. And I, I love the insights and the, the conversation. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, same here. Thanks. Thanks so much. As always, everybody out there, please stay safe. Mm -hmm.